still very complicated stuff. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to, um, to thank the organizers for uh, organizing this nice workshop and also for their support. Uh, to, today, I'm going to talk about teleconnections and link to regional scale precipitation from a statistical perspective. Uh, I would like to thank my colleagues and some of my co workers, Beda Bergawi, Leon Shafiq, uh, Faisal Siad, and Mohamed Latif, and Nikolai Tandavilov, and uh, Igor Zviriev, and also Tim Wellings from different parts. Uh, so I'll talk about, uh, give you a background on atmospheric flow, large scale features and uh, relation of teleconnections to precipitation and then uh, briefly on comment on teleconnection and extremes. Uh, so as I start, I thought maybe I'll give you just very brief background on uh, where I come from, where, where, where we come from. So that's um, a nice uh, winter view of <laughs> MISU. Uh, the department was established back in 1947 by Gustav Rossby when he came back from MIT. And uh, we do uh, quite an extensive uh, research program in um, different parts, uh, in different topics. We also uh, offer bachelor, master, and PhD programs. And I must say that uh, <coughs> MISO actually pioneered the uh, application of the uh, Open IFS in teaching. That was uh, encouraged by uh, Erland. Thanks for that. <laughs> Unfortunately, the, la the last two years, no uh, students actually uh, registered for the numerical prediction. <laughs> so, <laughs> Are you looking for PhD students? Uh, <laughs> we offer. <laughs> yeah, we offer. We, we offer PhD. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, we have some uh, uh, positions advertised, but not uh, not at the moment. <laughs> so, um, I mean, we talk when we talk about teleconnections, we can't really forget. Um, you cannot ov overcome. Um, the dichotomy between weather and climate and also Rossby waves. Uh, so I chose here to show you two pictures of uh, difference between weather and climate. Um, so the weather basically is the state of the atmosphere at a given place, whereas the climate can be defined as the collection of long-term statistics of weather as it was put by Edward Lawrence in 1970. But I also thought about something else, which is the, the memory we keep about the weather aggregation, and that's not really taken into account. Of course, I'm not going to develop this, but yeah, just uh, <coughs> so um, large scale flow and uh, Rossby waves. When we talk about Rossby waves, we basically look at propagations of small perturbations. Uh, <coughs> Ivana also talked about this um, before. Uh, a simple fra framework to um, um, study the Rossby waves is to, to use simply the linearized beta uh, plane vorticity equation. And this can explain actually a number of. Uh, <coughs> responses, <coughs> atmospheric responses to various forcing such as diabetic heating or uh, topography. And this is an example taken from uh, Hoskins and Caroli, where you have a uh, propagation of uh, response to a thermal forcing here. The response normally follows uh, great circles, um, and that's also as shown early on by Ivana uh, <coughs> from Horan and Wallace. Now, what is the problem in teleconnection? What is it? Um, <coughs> If you take, for example, here I've taken the um, monthly sea, level, sea surface temperature over the Indian Oceans. Um, if you take a, a base point, which is given by the uh, blue uh, cross, and you correlate that point with every other point, normally what you get, you get one at the base point, and then the correlation decreases outward. Uh, normally, monotonically, if you have uh, an autocorrelated noise. Uh, but this is not a generic situation. So if you take, for example, the sea level pressure, what you get, you get a kind of uh, tipping point, 
where you have a positive correlation in the south and then a negative correlation in the north, and that's the, um, the that's what we know, the North Atlantic Oscillation. So a bit of history here. Uh, <coughs> the question of teleconnections that seems to go back to uh, Hilbertson in uh, 1897 and also Lockyer in 1906, where they saw some sort of seesaw between Southeast Australia and South, uh, um, Southern America. Uh, <coughs> But it was in uh, 1935 that Angstrom in this paper, uh, Angstrom was not actually, by the way, was not, he was not an atmospheric scientist. Uh, so he noticed that the weather at a given place is not an isolated phenomenon, but uh, intimately connected with the weather at adjacent places. And also, uh, we cannot forget um, Gilbert Walker. Uh, <coughs> Gilbert Walker actually mentioned that the relationship between weather over Earth are so complex uh, so that it seems useless to try to derive them from theoretical considerations. Um, <coughs> by the way, Gilbert Walker was sent um, to, to study the Indian monsoon, but he ended up discovering the, uh, Arctic, the, um, the North Atlantic Oscillation and the Southern Oscillation. Uh, some of the main teleconnections, with this is also uh, some background material, the ENSO, which is uh, known, the ENSO is a coupled phenomenon in the ocean and the atmosphere, um, in the tropical Pacific, and also this is the um, uh, the southern oscillation. So this is a co point correlation where the base point is here. So you get a high correlation plus one, and then um, decreasing outward, and then you get a, a flipping or a change of sign of the correlation. <coughs> so that's the time series of the El Nino, and that's the um, Darwin sea level pressure, so you see the anti-correlation between both. Um, this is also shows the, <coughs> the wild worldwide effect of uh, El Nino that was also shown by Ivana early on. Um, uh, so these are also famous um, northern hemispheric teleconnections where we recognize the polar Eurasian pattern, NAO, Scandinavian pattern, PNA, uh, East Atlantic pattern, and also the East Atlantic West Russian pattern. So I should uh, say that these patterns are um, derived from a linear perspective, yeah, using EUFs and um, or, uh, rotated EUFs. Um, so the North Atlantic Oscillation, one of the main uh, modes of variability in the North, uh, Northern Hemisphere, uh, basically measures the seesaw of the atmospheric mass between the subtropics and uh, Iceland. Uh, the northern annular mode, um, which is a hemispheric version of the NAO, um, so that's a time series of the NAO plus, um, plus the um, spaghetti um, plots for um, seismic prediction, that's what we are supposed to do in this workshop. Um, <coughs> The dichotomy between NAO and AO can be seen and discussed by Embom. He can tell you more about it. <laughs> um, so why are we interested in teleconnection patterns? So as you have seen in the previous uh, talks, um, they link, obviously, remote locations on the Earth, and they also have a large impact on surface weather and climate. And they also describe large amounts of atmospheric variability, because that's, that's how they had been defined. They had been defined based on EUFs which means uh, maximizing the vari variability. And they can be used for different purposes, such as extended range seasonal prediction and also downscaling. So how to obtain these teleconnections? There is no unique way to obtain them. So that's, you should know from the outset, there are different ways, for example, stage uh, linear analysis based on regression, point correlation, uh, particular orthogonal functions, uh, nonlinear EUFs, empirical teleconnections, uh, cluster analysis, and also uh, composite analysis. And they, they normally tend to give slightly different results. So I will comment here on the, uh, one of the mostly wi widely used methods, which is the orthogonal, empirical orthogonal EUFs. So EUFs basically looks at the <coughs> looking at the, um, solving a linear uh, eigenvalue problem. Um, CU equal lambda U, where C is the covariance matrix. And this means that you end up with orthogonal pattern and uncorrelated pieces, and that's one of the um, weaknesses of EOFs. Uh, so this shows if you have, for example, a nice distribution like multinormal, that's the EOF1 and this EOF2. So, uh, uh, 
So this is, con this is an application of two sea level pressure from uh, NSEP and CAR. So the, EUF, the for leading EUF comes out as <coughs> Arctic Oscillation or NEO, it's a bit mixed. This is also one drawback of EUFs. They tend to mix uh, physical patterns. Um, whereas the second one is known as the Pacific pattern. And then you get the EUF3 with 9% explained variance as the Scandinavian pattern. And these are the different explained variants of the different um, <coughs> EUFs. Uh, there is also um, a paper that I published last year on giving an alternative to EUFs. And this is a regularized EUF. And actually what it does is simply overcomes <coughs> the um, pitfall of this uh, geometrical constraint. And it solves instead uh, <coughs> generalized eigenvalue problem, uh, where mu here, mu is the smoothing parameter. And the nice thing about this is that you can see here, by just plotting the Lagrangian, there is an optimum value of the smoothing parameter. So for, lambda, for mu equals zero, you get the standard EUFs. <coughs> so there is a standard, there is a price here. <coughs> This is an example of um, showing the difference between EUF1 and smooth or regularized EUF1. So the EUF1, the smooth EUF1 comes out clearly more as an Arctic oscillation rather than a mixed pattern. Um, so other tools like cluster analysis can also define clusters using either k-means or Gaussian mixture models. Um, <coughs> And I also mentioned that yesterday, for example, you've seen with Barbara, she talked about um, other um, tools like networks. So um, this is also, Ivan also mentioned teleconnection, um, linked to jet streams. Uh, so the jet stream is a belt of high wind speed uh, around the Earth, because it's not continuous. Um, <coughs> so that's a picture of the jet stream. Jet stream also has two components. The, the polar jet stream or the eddy driven jet stream and the subtropical jet stream. And the distinction between them is not really as uh, clear, perhaps only over the North Atlantic. Uh, it also depends on the ENSO phase, um, as, as, as mentioned by Ivana early on. Uh, <coughs> so, um, link, for example, so now you can see the link between uh, the jet and some of the uh, teleconnections or uh, modes of variability. So this is a work by uh, Wollings et al. in 2010, uh, where he shows that the NO essentially describes variation of the latitudinal position of the jet. Um, <coughs> of course, much, much of the extratropical weather and climate is associated with the jet. Um, and this can be used for, for different purposes, such as climate change and uh, large-scale flow. Uh, <coughs> so here I'm going to talk about the, uh, some of the work I uh, have been doing with colleagues on precipitation and teleconnection. And uh, the first thing is, the first one is uh, work by uh, Igor Zirya from, uh, from Moscow, uh, where we looked at the <coughs> link between the Mediterranean evaporation and teleconnection. So these two show the EUF1 and 2 of the Mediterranean evaporation, which comes from the Woods Hole um, Ocean Institution and also crew precipitation in year 40. <coughs> and that's the PC1 and PC2. So you can see the PC1 and PC2, uh, the PCs of the, uh, the most variability of Mediterranean evaporation has got interannual and also uh, interdecadal variability. So if you compose, for example, following PC1 positive, so they take the positive phase, which corresponds to a, uh, <coughs> a positive anomaly of the um, evaporation, you get a large, positive SST anomaly in the eastern Mediterranean, and vice versa if you take the, um, <coughs> the opposite of this. <coughs> so um, now look at the, um, the link between the evaporation and sea level pressure. So that's a large scale. Uh, so here I show you two, one for the winter and one for the summer. So for the winter, the correlation between the PC1 which shows an overall excess or um, <coughs> reduction of evaporation of the Mediterranean. You get what we know, well, that's the precisely the East Atlantic pattern. Yeah? And if you look at now at the, the composite with respect to the PC1 positive, 
So you get the effect of the um, <coughs> negative, the positive phase of the at East Atlantic pattern where you have dry uh, wind from the northern, um, from the uh, mid northern mid latitudes. And that enhances the, the, the evaporation. <coughs> the negative phase now uh, leads to a decrease of evaporation over the Mediterranean. Notice also that the, in, the winters, in the summertime, you get some sort of tropical origin of the um, effect on the Mediterranean evaporation. <coughs> so we have two tools that depends on, depending on the, on the season. Uh, we also looked at the uh, water budget and um, uh, by looking at the um, moisture transport. And the conclusion was that um, <coughs> during the positive phase of EUF1, which is global uh, excess of evaporation, main the moisture convergence is, is, is obtained over the uh, min, uh, minor Asia, uh, <coughs> whereas during the other phase, most, uh, the main moisture um, convergence is over the western and central uh, Medi Mediterranean. Another uh, nice example is also the link to the um, Asian monsoon. So this is some sort of work in progress. So you can see a nice dipole structure. That's the correlation between the Mediterranean evaporation and uh, all India rainfall. So all India rainfall is a nice index of, of precipitation for the monsoon. Uh, <coughs> I mean, despite the, uh, the shortness of the, the record, we get very nice um, enhancement of <coughs> evaporation in the eastern Mediterranean and vice versa. Um, we, um, some of the work also relate to the rainfall trends over the Indopak uh, summer monsoon. Uh, so here, um, <coughs> show you here the trend of the um, precipitation of, of the summer monsoon over the Indian, uh, Indian uh, subcontinent. So you can see here there is a negative trend of precipitation over central India, but there is an increasing trend over northern Pakistan. Um, <coughs> and this is by Latif, uh, who is a PhD student in Islamabad. Uh, and, the, and so he tried to link this to the, um, the moisture transport. So that's the vertically integrated meridional moisture transport. So there is a positive um, trend here and the negative trend of the Bay of Bengal. So that's links the um, de decreasing trend of central India to the Bay of Bengal, whereas the increasing trend over Pakistan is linked to the Arabian Sea moisture transport. There is also a link uh, <coughs> of the Pakistan precipitation to um, large scale, and that's a picture showing the uh, circumglobal teleconnection pattern, uh, more than the Indian, uh, tele Indian precipitation. <coughs> There's also some uh, work um, in progress on the monsoon uh, moisture transport and global SST. Um, <coughs> so Faisal is wor working on this, and he's looking at the uh, two boxes, one of the Bay of Bengal and the other one is of the uh, Arabian Sea. And <coughs> he looked at the correlation of PC1, the vertically integrated meridian moisture transport, and uh, sea surface temperature. Uh, so it seems that El Nino is forcing the moisture transport of the Arabian Sea uh, monsoon branch. Whereas the Ayo Indian Ocean Dipole forces more moisture transport over the Bay of Bengal. Uh, <coughs> there's also um, rela uh, work on the, now the detrended. Yeah, this one I showed the trend, but now uh, data has been detrended. So this is now the, the correlation of PC1 of vertically integrated meridional moisture transport with all India rainfall. <coughs> so what you can see here is that the South India precipitation is forced by El Nino, whereas the Northern Indian Pakistan is more forced by uh, the opposite phase. Um, this is uh, my last example, which shows a different part. This is um, northern tip, northern tip of uh, Africa. So that's uh, Tunisia, and I looked here at um, two stations, Bizert, which is in the north part, and then Siliana, which is in the foothill of, uh, the, uh, Ma of the Atlas chain. Uh, <coughs> and I looked at the lagged correlation between Bizert and 
October precipitation and uh, September sea level pressure. So these are monthly uh, precipitation. So you get a significant correlation over the um, SO region. So that's uh, associated with the positive phase of the um, uh, of the ENSO. So that's the El Nino. So that's the northern part. I mean, th they are simply few few hundred kilometers away. But yet, if you look at the southern uh, the foothill of the um, Atlas chain, you get an NEO uh, uh, correlation, NEO signal, uh, which, yeah, which is a bit surprising. So a um, few words on teleconnection and extreme. So as I said, these EUFs and South, they are based on a linear analysis. So you take the um, <coughs> EUFs, which are directions. They are not actual uh, positions in the, face, in the state space. Um, <coughs> and it has some um, serious drawbacks. And in particular, they don't treat extremes in any special way. Uh, <coughs> so here we propose a different alternative by um, myself and um, Nikolai Trendefilov uh, from Open University uh, on archetypal analysis. So what archetypal analysis does, it basically identified the uh, convex hull of the data and uh, tried to identify typical uh, patterns on this um, <coughs> on this on this. Um, uh, convex hull. <coughs> so this is a picture of the convex hull. So this is the, my data. This is the convex hull, which is a, is a convex envelope. And then you try to identify a number of typical or pure types, archetypes, on this, um, on this convex hull. <coughs> so the, the objective to minimize is this is, uh, the ob this is the cost function that we minimize. And A and B, actually, they are probability matrices, like, you, like those used in uh, Markov chains. So if I applying this to the uh, sea surface temperature, we get really three robust, quite robust patterns. And they come out as El Nino extreme phase and La Nina extreme phase. Not the asymmetry between El Nino and La Nina. Now, these are not directions. They are um, actual positions in, 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 face, in, in state space. And the other one is, is a bit surprising is the, what we labeled here, the western boundary current. And that's, um, <coughs> that's the, the time series associated with the western boundary current. So it seems that the western boundary currents have been, are increasing. Um, not much work has looked at. I looked at this in the literature, but there's not really much work done this, uh, on this. So it seems that the western boundary currents are uh, increasing. Uh, sorry. <coughs> so this is also an application to the uh, sea level pressure uh, from um, 1948 to 2015. Um, <coughs> and I also get some four robust archetypes. Um, so the first one is the NAO comes out really robustly. The other one is not, a is not really a positive NAO. It's more of a mixture between Eurasia and Mediterranean. So <coughs> So these are the extreme phases of, um, of NAO and this pattern. But there's also the polar Eurasian archetype extreme phase. And there's also a pattern here that links the Atlantic to the, to, uh, the Pacific, the Northern Pacific to uh, Scandinavia. And uh, this is my summary, which is basically uh, contains what I have been saying. And some, uh, um, sorry. Some uh, references, if you are interested in more. Questions.